thanks for coming. This is actually one of the most exciting days we've ever had. We've, been, we've done literally 150 composer signings in the last 20 years. And we've been trying to get Charles Fox for oh, almost 20 years with very little luck. So you guys, you guys are in for a treat. You have a surprise guest who's going to show up later on. Um, but your uh, your host today is Jerry McCauley. He wrote the the liner notes for Barbarella. Uh, just by way of bio, for me, I've worked for, with Verez for about 15 years. I've worked uh, writing about music for since I was in college, many moons ago. Uh, have worked for Rolling Stone, Request Magazine, BAM Magazine. I don't. People think I specialize in film music. I have people think I specialize in 70s music. Everybody thinks I specialize in something else, which makes me feel good. I, I, that's because I just. That's the kind of upbringing I had. I had a music teacher in high school uh, who just impressed upon us. Music is music. It's just an infinite variety of things. Oh, Charles. It is Charles, Charles Fox. First of all, shall I use this or is this okay? Or Oh, this is the microphone for that recording. Do I need this or not? Okay, I'll have to <laughs> It's stereo. I definitely want to be heard while I'm here. Um, uh, Bob Crew actually was trained as, a, as an artist, as a painter. I own some of his paintings, actually. Um, and as a young man, he, uh, he did, had no thought of becoming a songwriter. He thought he'd just be, become an artist. And uh, along the way, yeah, I mean, his, his other passion, his other talent came out. He, did, he kept painting, by the way, um, forever. He never stopped that. He used to have showings in New York, in, uh, here in Hollywood. Um, and uh, in his house, he had some... Bob was just a creative force. He was a, truly a creative force. Um, we went to several houses of his um, where he, would, he did all the decorating and he would put inventive, beautiful things all over the walls. It was, just, it was like a museum to walk into his house, no matter what it is. Sometimes it being 50s style, sometimes modern style. He was just a creative force. Um, in our working together, um, it was great. It was just great. First of all, to be honest with you, before I started working with Bob Crew, I basically only wrote Spanish songs. I mean, that is to say Latin songs with Spanish lyrics, even though I didn't speak Spanish. Um, but I had the feel for the music, and I, and I used to write for these Latin bands, salsa bands, Tito Puente and T Ray Barreto, and, and I played with those bands. Uh, that was my early thing. <clears throat> so when I started working with Bob Crew with, uh, on Barbarella, um, he said, um, well, let's do the songs together. And, the, and of course, prior to that now, <coughs> shall I keep going or you want to ask me questions? Well, no, well, I would, we just to backtrack a little bit. You, you didn't actually meet Bob Crew on, for Barbarella. You worked with a, a piano player called Ben Lanzarone. Right. So Bob was, um, was one of the top music producers in New York in the 60s. You know, he produced all the Four Seasons records and uh, um, so many other great records and wrote a lot of those songs. Wrote all the Four Seasons songs along with Bob Gordia mostly. And um, I had someone who introduced me to him and um, he was well aware of my background. I had studied classical music, I had played jazz and pop and Latin and all that. Uh, and he said he had always wanted to do a record that incorporated the classics, classical music, and all these other elements I just mentioned. Uh, he said uh, he has a, a great pianist, and um, he loved me to j just put together an album for him. It was like a dream assignment. Just look into the classics, see what you want to do, tr treat it any way you want to treat it. Just bring me an album <laughs> that he'll produce. So I started working with his pianist, and he was not really good enough, to be honest with you. And it was a hard thing for me to tell that to Bob because I didn't want to talk myself out of a job. So I said to Bob, uh, um, as much as I want to do this, he's just not going to cut it. He's not good enough. He said, I don't care, find a pianist. So this Ben Lanzaroni was um, actually we went to the same high school in music and art in New York. He was two years ahead of me. Someone introduced me to him, and, and we've been great friends ever since. He's a fantastic pianist jazz, classical, Latin. He was the perfect fit for that. And, um, and actually, Bob and I and Ben um, were... Uh, Bob was very much into astrology, 
And before he'd work with you, he had a check with his astrologer, believe it or not. And both Ben and I had to find out not only what day we were, we knew what day we were born, but we had to find out um, what hour we were born. We had to ask our mothers. And the astrologer proved this trio working together, and we went on to do a lot of great things together. Um, so I, I did, I basically what I did with this other album, I found pieces that I loved in, in, of the classical repertoire. Um, pieces for, for a Requiem and uh, Beethoven sonatas and things. And um, I basically turned them into new pieces. I, I'd use fragments of pieces and turn it into something. Um, Bob added uh, lyrics later. Actually, one of the things that came out of the Mozart G minor symphony was uh, um, a piece that is on Vicky Carr's greatest hits album. Um, so that really turned out well. And, and really, Bob in the studio was a master. Um, we'd have a big orchestra, and he'd hear sounds, and his, 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 his way of handling it and mixing, everything was joyful, never, nothing was ever, there was never any pressure, there was never any problem, it's just like, let's find great music together, you know. And then even in mixing, I mean, I, okay, so I finished that, and, uh, and then he had a, a group called the Bob Crew Generation at that time, you may remember, had some hit records. So he asked me to do some of that arranging, and then, um, well, then that led to, um, to Bob Rella. And I don't know if uh, many of you are aware of this, but the score that Charles and Bob Crew worked on was a replacement score. The film had already been completely scored in Europe by a composer named Michel Monnier, who worked with uh, director Roger Vadim quite a bit. And I think that uh, Monnier, I looked him up and did around 70 scores between 1960 and the time he died was 1984, I believe. Um, yeah, uh, and uh, there's a piece you can find online. The album I think is available in Europe. It's kind of hard to find. The, 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 it's been re-released, um, but there is a demo for the title song on YouTube that you can find that, that he recorded uh, with a British singer, and uh, it's not that different. Now, why would you take something that that's very similar to what you did? I think that the answer, I mean, there's, it's, it's kind of hard to pin all this together, but uh, Bob Crew signed a deal with uh, Paramount in 1967, in the summer of 67, that uh, called for distribution of his Dino Voice label and a lot of records on Dot Records, which Paramount owned. And uh, it was also a production deal. Now, I've, not, I've seen the, the, the original Billboard articles. It doesn't say exactly production of what. Now, obviously, Bob never produced a film for them. But it seems to me that when you have a, somebody who has the track record of Bob Crew and you've got a, a deal with them, it seemed to me that it, was more, it wasn't an artistic decision, it was a business decision on Paramount's part. Does that make sense to you? You see, I'm learning so much today, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know about the, I, I never heard that song. I didn't even know, we, we knew it was a replacement score, that we knew. And, and actually, Bob, because of um, Dot Records was owned by Paramount, or Paramount distributed that or something like that. And his company, Dynavoice, there was a connection. I know that he was, uh, that's why he was asked to do the score. He, well, Bob was not a film scorer. I just f scored my first movie, a movie called The Incident. It was a black and white film for 20th Century Fox. That's what Larry, directed by Larry Pierce. Larry Pierce. Yeah, and Larry Pierce, who was still a very dear friend of mine, of ours. Um, I've done a lot of pictures with Larry. And, uh, but that was the first one. And, and the second picture of Larry came maybe I'm jumping ahead, but after Bob Rella, I had been up for a picture called Goodbye Columbus, and um, it wasn't coming so fast. I was in the guy, and I wasn't in town yet. I was still in, in New York. Uh, in order to do Bob Rella, um, a lot of the, uh, the people at Paramount weren't, weren't sure, and I'm not answering a question about, uh, about the Dynavoice thing and all that, but Bob did have a deal, and uh, that's how he got the job. And, Otherwise, they would not have come to him to score a picture. He wasn't a film composer. Um, I wasn't getting the, uh, this call back for so quickly about um, coming to, to uh, California to do Bob Rella, even though I'd just done a score successfully with, uh, with Larry Pierce. But um, the folks at Paramount Pictures sent um, uh, some people to New York to see who this young fellow was doing this big picture. And that's when I kind of get, got involved with the workings in Hollywood. I mean, a fellow named uh, Paul Hager came, out, came to New York. He later became uh, um, 
the head of post-production at Paramount, and actually there's a building named the Paul Hager Building, but at this time he was my music editor, and the first thing he said to me is, I'm going to be a music editor, and I said, great, what does a music editor to do? <laughs> And he said, well, um, I will, uh, first of all, we'll sit and we'll, we'll go through the score, the picture, and we'll, we'll do a breakdown of um, where, determine where the picture, the music goes, and, and uh, then I'll give you a breakdown down to a tenth of a second. So I said, I think I did that, Paul. He said, you did that? And I said, I did. Yeah, I went through the whole score, took my notes. My, I didn't know, I never heard of a music editor. And actually, in New York at that time, uh, Fiddish counters on the movie always um, didn't include second counters. There were only footage counters. So um, I used to work in New York for Skitch Henderson when he was with The Tonight. I did a lot of music for The Tonight Show at one point when he first, uh, with Johnny Carson. And uh, Skitch gave me this little thing called a uh, Ready Eddie, and it translated film footage to seconds. So I did all that myself. So then Paul said to me, uh, Will you be needing clicks? I said, What's that? <laughs> I, I honestly, I learned with a stopwatch. Um, Six Kiss Henderson gave me a stopwatch when I got started to do little documentary films. And he said, uh, come over to my house, I gave you my stopwatch. And it had 30, uh, 36 millimeters, 16 millimeter, and even 8 millimeter uh, seconds. And with that, I, I started my film career with this little stopwatch. I still use it, by the way. <laughs> Same stuff. I may have had a new one along the way. Um, so I was un completely unaware of all the, the technicalities in doing films and everything in Hollywood. I used to have a stopwatch on the piano and I had to play the piano conductor with a stopwatch. And, uh, yet, I, yet you had, I want to I wanna backtrack because this is an interesting period you're talking about. The, the things that you did for, for The Tonight Show, I think technically they're called bumpers. The, the music that's played during a commercial break for the, to entertain the audience. You actually wrote original music and did arrangements of, of popular tunes? I did, yeah. Actually, that was, um, I'll tell you how... how I started a sketch. I used to write uh, arrangements for him. Sometimes he would come out and play a piano piece of the orchestra, and he'd ask me to do a special arrangement for him. And then uh, he started asking me, "Well, why don't you write some of those little bumpers you see, in, you know, in, on track music between com commercials? Music, band goes, uh, the camera goes into commercial, and uh, to entertain the audience. Uh, the music they still do that. The music keeps playing. If you're in the studio, you'll hear the music keep playing." Um, and then they come back and they fade out. When, so I started writing those pieces and um, I wrote a number of them to show you how naive I was about the business aspect of, uh, of music. Uh, the fellow named Shelley Cohn was the musical librarian for The Tonight Show. And one day he said to me, so are you ASCAP or BMI? And I said, uh, what? I, I was neither. I was neither. I didn't, never thought of it. I, I said, what are, what are those or something in name like that? And he said, oh, well, they, they pay you money for uh, when your music is on the end. I said, really? <laughs> now, at, at, the same, at the same time you were doing this, were you under, were you under contract to what, what was then known as Score Productions? Or I was, was never this... under contract with Score Productions. Okay. No. You were, how, what would you, how do you describe the arrangement? Scorpio, the fellow named Bob Israel, who basically had people write things for him and put his name on it. Okay. Yeah. But you did some pretty impressive work for Score Productions. Um, I, I did a whole bunch of, of stuff. But anyway, I'll just backtrack on one second. So sh this fellow, Shelley Cohen, asked me to, uh, yeah, was I BMI and ESCAP? I said, I, neither. He, he said, well, I'll pay you money. And I said, really? And um, he, so he wrote down a BMI and gave me a telephone number. And he asked up and gave me a telephone number. And the first number that was BMI, and, I, and BMI knows this story. I've been with them since 1962 now. This was 1962. And I called BMI and I said, is it true that you pay money when your music is on television? They said, sure, come on down, we'll give you an advance. <laughs> I never called ASCAP. It was just the first number was that we paid off and that was it. <laughs> the people at ASCAP know that too. Um, anyway, um, 1965, um, this Bob um, Israel, who had score productions, he was in music house. He would re do music for various commercials for, uh, he was involved with... Um, basically, he was like a, a big contractor that would hire composers to do these jobs. Isn't that he, basically it? I don't think it was a contractor. It was a music production house. He produced the music. Okay. He, he, he sometimes would pay for it. 
Hey, Danny. <laughs> um, he, Danny, the seat's up here if you want to sit. No. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll take it. He's, other, he's Robbie. It's my son, Robbie. Yeah. He wrote uh, So I Married an Axe Murderer, yeah, yeah. screenwriter, yeah. And playing, playing the, uh, the field last year? Playing for keeps. Playing for keeps, right. Playing for keeps. Um, what was I saying? We were talking about, about score. Oh, score protector. Sorry. I lost my train of thought. Um, so Bob Israel asked me, um, oh, there was a new show coming on the air that ABC was doing. I don't remember how, what led up to this, uh, frankly. But the first thing I recall doing for him or maybe not the first thing, but um, there was a new show coming on the air that was a Saturday afternoon um, show about sports. Um, it, it never had been done before, um, where they show excerpts of different sporting events that went on that particular, it's called Wide World of Sports. Um, so he asked me to do that. Um, so I did that, and I started to work for him, and. Um, However, his name was on as the author of it, even though I wrote the music. Um, but I was, you know, like it was a good job for me, to be honest with you. Went to London and uh, recorded the music. Actually, the first time I did that, I did that at the Sound Recording Studio in New York with a big orchestra with strings. And then the folks at ABC thought that there was too much... Uh, they wanted a, a stronger, more powerful sound, maybe just more brassy. So we went to England, and um, I worked at the, uh, the um, Wimbledon, uh, not Wimbledon, what is that studio called? Wembley, uh, Wembley thank you, Wembley Studio. Uh, and actually in the booth was John Richards, who eventually, um, he, he was the second engineer, working for Eric Tomlinson, who was the, the first engineer. Uh, and John, and John eventually, I brought him over from England to, um, to be the head engineer at Evergreen Studios when, uh, when Artie Butler and I had a big studio here in town. He was the second engineer. Anyway, so we recorded uh, with basically a brass, woodwinds, you know, big percussion section, no strings. And that's the one that went on the air. Now, did it have the, um, was the narration in place at that point? Did you have to write around that it was, was the narration part of the, essentially part of the music? It was not part of the music, but it was there. It was on the. But uh, I mean, it yeah. was something had a, you had to, to be emphasize. Honest, I, don't, I don't recall. I don't recall if I heard the victory, agony of victory, the agony of defeat, and thrill of victory or something. It turned out that when we moved to California, that a good friend of mine, who became a good friend, Stanley Ross, was the one who wrote that copy. And Interesting. And who created Wonder Woman? Who also created Wonder Woman? Thanks. I put him up front for that reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway. I ended up doing quite a bit of work for, for Bob Israel, and um, it was, you know, he was a friend, and, uh, and it, was, it, was, it was bringing me to work as a composer. My background was uh, in Latin music professionally. I played piano with Latin bands. I wrote for those bands. Um, but my studying behind that was in classical music and jazz. Um, so with Bob, I had the opportunity to write original music, and along the way, I did a, a number. This is not with Bob Israel, but I did a number of documentary films. If I had a choice between doing a, an arrangement for a rock and roll band or a, a short documentary film, I, I knew my direction was hopefully going to be as a composer. So I would do that. And um, you did quite a few game show themes at that I point. I did. Too. I did. A, I did uh, some of the Guts and Todman game shows, like To Tell the Truth, What's My Line, Match Game. Yeah, and actually we used to go over to uh, England to record those as well. Um, and then a couple of years later, um, ABC wanted um, to put a show on, a football show on at night, Monday Night Football. And Wide World Sports had not been successful, so they wanted the same team that did all the work for, uh, Monday, for uh, um, Saturday Night um, Football. Thank you, Wide World Sports. Um, so then I, I did um, um, some Monday Night Football. It turned out to be very successful. And, um, so I, and that was under my own name because I wouldn't do that anymore, you know. Now those, those themes, I would assume, had, had a lot to do with Nadja Boulanger and your training in, in Paris? That's a funny question. Um, you know, everything I think I do has to do with my training. 
I think everything I've ever done has to do with my training. I think everything I've ever done has to do with the lifetime experiences that I've gathered, as we all do, you know, from what's what we read about in life and what we see and what we listen to and uh, what we experience. Um, so I think in that case, yes, I mean, there's nothing directly. I had the very good fortune of studying with um, some pe- uh, extraordinary teacher, many of you may know, Nadia Boulanger. Do you know who that is? No. She was Aaron Copeland's teacher 40 years before me. And she taught generations of, uh, of composers who came to her from around the world, generous of some of the great classical composers. Elia Carter. Um, she, her teacher was Ferre. Her best friend was Stravinsky, and her classmate in school was Ravel. So I, I was uh, I brought into that world. I only went to study with her for the summer in 1959 in the Fontainebleau. And there was a palace about 40 miles out of uh, Paris. It was, it was a palace of Napoleon, actually. Well, Francois I, before that, he built it. Um, I was there for the summer, and um, she changed my life. Nadia Bonnachie has changed my life. I knew, I knew from the first moment that I was with her that um, this is what I was, I was born to do, to write music. Uh, I always thought so anyway. I, I went to the high school of music and art. I studied composition post-high school with my composition teacher. I studied orchestration privately post-high school also with my high school composition uh, orchestration teacher. But, um, but I knew that uh, this was I, what I was born to do in my life when I was with her. I said she had a way of telling you what what it was all about. And she, she asked me to stay on and study with her in Paris after that. Um, and she made it possible for me to stay on and study with her in Paris. Um, and I was there with her for about two years. And um, as I say, she changed, she changed my life. And I saw very often, I had at least one private lesson uh, a week, and sometimes I lived close by, and uh, if there was an, em- an empty hour, she would send someone over to get my house to get me, you know. We had no telephones. And um, I'd see her once a week for a, a, a um, fantastic, very difficult um, four hours in the morning from 8 to 12 where you didn't dare take a bathroom break, you know. You just didn't leave the piano. But it was, it was a keyboard harmony class. It was about five or six of us. And um, she was at one grand piano when we were at the other, and she would ask us to do things like transpose Schubert songs at sight and, you know, sight read scores of Mozart, you know, at the, at the piano and uh, take melodies and play them backwards and upside down and inside out. And uh, uh, anyway, it was, it was fantastic. And in her living room, she had a huge pipe organ, believe it or not. So, so when I came back from Paris, um, and in Paris, I was exposed to a lot of different kind of music, you know, the music of the real avant-garde at that time. Um, Pierre Boulez was, um, you may know who him from his work, he's either as a great composer, was one of the great um, 12-tone composers of the century, but he also was a conductor of the New York Philharmonic for years. And um, he was kind of the enfant terrible, you know, in, uh, in Paris. And he had a concert series called Domaine Musical at a beautiful Teatro Odeon, um, where all the great modern composers, Stockhausen, Luigi Nono, Henri Pesseur, um, um, they all came and they presented new work. Some was electronic. And the audience was great. The audience, it was packed. It was very difficult then because the, all, the, you know, all the, the, uh, the music students in Paris came and the teachers came and anyone interested, the intellectuals and all that. And, and people would boo when they didn't like it and they would scream when they liked it and sometimes they played things. It was really a lively group. Um, and Pierre Boulez was the conductor and he was an extraordinary conductor. So when I was back in America, um, I found out that Uzuchevsky, Vladimir Uzuchevsky, was teaching electronic music at Columbia University. It was, it was a joint university uh, uh, electronic lab between Columbia and Princeton. It was one of only five in the whole world. Uh, Vladimir Uzuchevsky and Otto Luning were the ones who invented electronic music, originally called music concrete, where they would take original sounds, live sounds, acoustic sounds, record them, put them in a machine, and then alter the sounds with different devices, and then build layers and layers of sounds. 
And sometimes or, just by changing, merely changing the speed, you change the note. Any different, any manner any, any, different. You know, anything that works. So he, I never met Looney, but it was, uh, it was I went to study with him. It was a small class, maybe eight or ten of us. It was a small studio. There's one of five. There was, there was the only one in America was in Columbia University. And actually, I, uh, I couldn't audit the class. I had actually enrolled in Columbia University to be able to take the course. So now as a student at Columbia, for that one course anyway. And um, um, it was fantastic. Um, but this was prior, be, pre the synthesizer. There was no synthesizer. There was no voltage controlled keyboard, which is what Moog's genius was, that he put for a voltage control in a keyboard. Um, and what we did to, to organize sounds and manipulate them and construct them was um, we had sound banks of um, sound generators, sine waves, square waves, sawtooth waves, you know, and you find the note you'd want, you record it, and you find the next note you want to record it, and you little by little. And then we had, this is before the, the computer, so we had graphs that showed us if we were at the metronome speed of 100, say, and we're recording at 7.5 ips or 15, uh, then a quarter note would be an inch and a quarter. And an eighth note would be a bit. And so we'd end up taking these little bits and pieces of melody that we had just recorded note by note by note by note, put them together, splice them together in a little splicing box, you know, like this. You can have 15, 16 notes in there. And then with like a lot of leader tape, so that it was, you could, you could then send it into different places. So we had ring modulators, you know, we'd take the sound and split it 400 cycles this way, 400 cycles that way. Um, any, any matter of different ways of treating sounds to get different sounds out of it. And to go like, like a little loop in, you know. And then while it went through that, you'd do things to alter, and you'd capture that on a monaural tape recorder. Because at that time, the four track, uh, three track, Beatles did most of their work on three tracks, you know, not even four tracks. Um, the monaural tape recorders, uh, um, the four track tape recorders, didn't have cell sync position. You couldn't play back one channel and record on top of it. Well, we all do that now. It's, you know, this layer. At that time, you, if you had a four track, you either re recorded live into the four track, or um, as we had, four manual tape recorders with one button. So whatever you do on one machine, you have to do something different four times. And the mix was to put it onto the four track machine to be able to mix it down. So it would take about a year and a half to get a melody, you know? <laughs> um, a lot of very good music was written. Stockhausen used to come over to work there. Um, and, and people, and, and as I say, the, I didn't think I mentioned, but there were only five in the world. There was that one, there was two in Germany, in Darmstadt, in Cologne, Germany. There was one in uh, France, and it was Radio Diffusion. And Philip, Phillips had the, had the other one in the Netherlands. Who did? Phillips. Where was that? Netherlands, Holland. I didn't even know that. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. there was one in Israel at that time. I, I only knew five. In either case, that was my entree to electronic music. So it was very arduous to do that, but it was very, very um, enlightening. You know what you could do with electronic sounds and uh, and how you could alter them and make compositions out of them. And uh, although it was very time consuming, when Moog came along and invented his first synthesizer. Um, I was with BMI, and I called them, and I said, uh, I really need to get this machine, and they advanced me the money to buy this thing. I was already busy working. So I had the big Moog 3, I don't know if you even And have they were seen really it. inexpensive, weren't they? They were inexpensive? They were really inexpensive in those days. Oh. I'm being facetious. Yeah, no, it was, it was very expensive, actually, very expensive. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, and also, it was a mineral machine. You had one keyboard. Um, with a ribbon control, you could, and you could do that, but one keyboard. And um, it was the very beginning of electronic keyboard operated music. It was before the ARP, it was before all those things. The Buchler now had, a, a, there was a touch plate system. There was not keyboards, you know, if you know that system. Um, anyway, uh, so I bought it. Uh, for a couple of years later, he, he came out with a second keyboard so that you could have two melodies going at the same time. There was no, no harmony because if you'd hit, have your note on your finger on one note and you play another, the first note would disappear. It was a strictly a mineral instrument. One note canceled out the other. 
It's always the low note, I think. That but I did, I did films in it with that thing. I did, um, around this, this all in the early 60s, mid-60s, I did a film with Marcel Marceau, um, where he played all the parts. You know Marcel Marceau? The great mimes. Maybe the greatest. He's in Barbarella? He's in Barbarella. And he, and he has his only word he ever, he ever spoke in film. He says, no. Um, anyway, so I did a film with Marcel Marceau. It was a half hour film, but we played all the film festivals and things like that. And um, he played all the parts of a man who, um, well, Bip, his character Bip, if you can picture him with a funny hat and all that, he wanders onto a ship. And he becomes the, the flutist of the band. He's the drummer of the band, the accordion player of the band. And he was the captain. He, he played all those parts. And um, he was chasing a, a, a figment of his imagination, a beautiful woman. And she was elusive, and he never, you know, it's just in his... Anyway, I played, I did that role, the synthesizer. And so for each part he played, I played that according of the synthesizer. And actually, he came to my house. We worked together here, here in California, um, Marcel. And um, so that, but I had a lot of nice experiences. And I, and I used the, uh, my synthesizer as part of a number of motion pictures that I did over the years. Uh, and then at some point, um, I think I gave my, my synthesized student to, to you when he was at um, my, Northwestern. My, my grades weren't up and up, so we had to <laughs> <laughs> I borrowed them with a synthesizer. Anyway, I, g I gave Northwestern my whole synthesizer studio at one point, all my tape recorders, and had eight, eight track tape recorders at that time. Um, and then I moved, you know, I keep moving up to whatever's contemporary, which I still do. Uh, let's talk a little bit about when, when you got hired to do. Uh, Barbarella, how you uh, worked on the songs. I think you said that uh, Bob Crew had rented a, a place up in Montauk where you went with your family and, and basically spent. He did. Weeks he rented with him. Uh, Edward Albee's place in, uh, in Montauk, and we spent uh, the summer. Um, my wife and I, and my son as a young as a young baby, um, came up and we spent the summer, and, and we basically wrote the songs together over the summer. And Bob was the kind of guy. Um, different than myself who would love for some kind of beautiful atmospheric place to inspire him you know I, I just needed a room with a piano you know there was a difference so, but we wrote all the songs together over the summer and then I went home and I scored the film uh, in in my in my apartment in New York and what was your what was your impression the first time you watched now was it did it have the original score you never never actually heard the score was it without score at that point? I never heard the original score. Okay. No, I, I just know there was an original score. And I didn't know, among the things I learned that, that Jerry wrote was um, that the fellow, what, and tell me his name again. Michel Monnier. Michel Monnier. Monnier? Monnier, I believe. Monnier. If my wife were here, she can speak French, but. Well, I, I speak French. Is it uh, uh, M-A-G-N-I-E-R? M-A-G-N-E. N-E, Monnier, I guess. Yeah. Um, I'm close. Anyway, um, so he went on to, um, I learned by reading the line in notes that he wrote, he went on to build a, one of the great recording studios in France called Chateau. Chateau de Horoville. Horoville. H D apostrophe H E O H E R O U V I L L E. De Horoville, I guess, but that, yeah. but that. Otherwise known, better known as uh, Elton John, nicknamed it the Honky Chateau. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, and actually, just a few blocks from here, um, uh, Artie Butler, a very good friend and composer and arranger and all that, um, and I uh, bought the Magnolia Movie Theater, and we turned that into Evergreen Recording Studios. Yeah. They, they filmed it's, it's, La La Land. What? They filmed some of La La Land. In they filmed some of the movie. La well, we did over the years many... Well, the, it's, it's one of the it's one of the more interesting. What I would I, it's not coincidence. It's called I, I think Jung had the right phrase for it. It's called synchronicity. That you two guys would would have this connection and then have this develop these two studios that are that are you know. Well, with me, it grew out of frustration. Frankly, I was working on a picture called One on One that Paul Williams and I wrote a bunch of songs, and uh, we asked Seals and Crafts, the major stars at that time, to sing the songs. And I produced the record actually with um, Louis Shelton, who was their, other, their producer. And um, I was in a studio called TTG, and I was overdubbing. We, I think we, Paul and I wrote five songs for Seals and Crofts. And I think that record is out on Verez Saravan, the one on one soundtrack. Yeah. Bought it today. Hmm? Bought it today. Bought it today. Okay, thank you. 
Um, I was in a studio with Sales and Crafts, and they're, of course, used to recording in a record studio. We have 24 tracks. You want to go back and punch in, and we punch in a word and note. We all know what that is. Um, but when we were working on film, you had to, we, were, we were recording onto film, onto 35 millimeter stripe. Um, and you can have three channels. But every time you recorded something, you had to go back to a start mark. Everything had to go back in a line. You couldn't go back a second and go forward. And really, because of their frustration, do we really have to do this? Which we had to do. It's the only way to do it at that time. Um, and actually, Jimmy uh, Seals and Dash Crofts used to, um, uh, the fantastic duo they were, they didn't record together. Each one recorded separately. And then the other one would be in the booth next to me and say, you're flat, you're sharp, you know, whatever. <laughs> but they, they sang great together. I once tried to convince them I should join the group. It should be Shields and Crofts and Fox, because I sounded so good with them, but <laughs> they, they, they didn't go for it. Um, anyway, but I, it was really born out of my frustration. So with, I was working with an engineer named Rick Riccio out in Orange County. He was actually at Jose Feliciano's studio. And um, I said to him, it's just too bad that in a, re in a recording studio you have so many, how much greater opportunity to, to go back and forth and punch in. I said, but working on film and Stripe, you have none of that. I said, it's too bad you can't coordinate that and synchronize. He said, there's no reason you can't. I said, you mean you can, can synchronize the tape recorder? Well, that was silly. We, we know this. But there wasn't a studio any place that did this. I said, so you mean you can synchronize a tape recorder with film? He said, sure. So on that basis, we decided to build a recording studio. Um, and we did, and we were the first studio any place to record film in sync with, with, uh, on, a, on a tape machine. Yeah. Just by the way, I grew up in the Magnolia Theater. It was oh, the, yeah. literally the first theater I saw a movie in. That was in our neighborhood. No kidding. Yeah. So... Well, we preserved the we preserved the um, the projection booths over mm -hmm. above, and actually we bought um, and I, they're still there. At least last time I was at the studio, we bought Magnavox, Magna, Magnavox, Magna something uh, projectors, thirty five millimeter projectors. We had two studios, um, and each one capable of you know big screens, and we did many many motion pictures. And, Let's talk about the sessions for Barbarella, which were at uh, A and R Studios, A &R St Street, the great A and R Studio on Forty Eighth Street. Yeah. And I think Crew had recorded there at, at some point too previously. He I believe. Yeah, everyone recorded. It was one of the great. It was one of the best of all the New York studios. Yeah. And you had uh, brought on Ben Lanzaroni was part of the part of the crew. So, so Ben Lanzaroni, who was the pianist, I did this record with. He he was an integral part of it. We had a, we had a big orchestra. We had. And then we, we had, talked about Vinnie Bell. Uh, who's probably not a familiar name to you, but you've all heard his music, um, guitar player. And you told me, this is interesting, that Vinnie Bell is actually responsible for more of the electronic sounds in Barbarella than you were with your synthesizer. I, I really didn't use my synthesizer very much in Barbarella. We had Vinnie Bell. Uh, Vinnie Bell was, was, was like the, one of the greatest of all the New York uh, guitarists. In the studio, studio guitarist in the 60s and 70s. He went on actually to have a hit record with the theme from Airport. Won the Grammy Award, Best Instrumental. He did, yeah. And that, the thing that Vinnie Bell, I think, is most famous for is not necessarily, is he's like Les Paul, in a way. Uh, Les Paul's more famous for his inventions and what he did with, with the technology. Solid body of the guitar, yeah. Yeah. And sound on sound recording, that's, that's him too. Yeah. But Vinnie... Um, was instrumental in developing the electric 12-string guitar and all of the, the various outboard effects that I think people take for granted that are now just little digital effects. He actually yeah. put he had all these boxes together to create all these sounds. Now, if you hear the famous guitar in Twin Peaks, Vinnie Bell. And that's kind of his signature sound. Well, if you, if you do listen to this Barbarella soundtrack... Basically, all the electronic sounds you hear all came from Vinnie Bell, one way or the other. He invented a, a thing called the Belzuki, uh, he, the electric sitar. Yeah. Um, he was just a great, um, a wonderful musician. He was a great, and it, when, he, when he had a hit record, you know, I called him, I said, so Vinnie, are you going to go on the road now? And he said, no, I like my pasta too much, man. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now, have you heard uh, uh, a 60s hit called uh, Green Tambourine by the Lemon Pipers? Vinnie Bell. Band of Gold, Frida Payne, Vinnie Bell. I'll tell you another story that I love about Vinnie Bell. That um, I had my first opportunity, maybe I was early 20s, 22, 23, to do a, I did a lot of commercials, but I did commercials arranging other people's music. But the first opportunity they had to do my own music was a big deal for me for a commercial. And um, I just used one guitarist who was going to play three sounds, one of the bass and the guitar and the melody. And I brought Vinnie Bell into the studio. And um, the uh, producer didn't pay me much respect at all. He just spoke directly to Vinnie. Can, Vinnie, can we do this? Vinnie, can we do that? And I felt like kind of helpless out there. I was a young fellow just happy to have a job, you know. Uh, felt kind of helpless in the studio. And every time he turned to me, he said, what do you think? Should I do that? Was this good? And every time I said, that's fine, Vinnie. Or, well, I'll try it this way. So he just brought me into the... You know, I, I never forgot him for that because... Uh, the producer was just, I, I was the guy who had written the music, but, but then he kind of left me out of the picture, you know, dealing directly with Vinny. He was such a gentleman about that. I never, I never forgot that. That, that. To me, that's an interesting aspect of um, studio work and what Bob Crew does. It's psychology. And I think that Bob Crew uh, would have been a hell of a baseball manager because he knew how to work with players and get the best out of everybody and put a team together and get an end result. He did. He, he did know how to put a team. But great musicians. People loved to work with him. It was a joyous, uh, a joyous thing to be in a session with Bob Crew. He just loved what he heard, loved what people did, appreciated it, and uh, um, had a lot of good results. Hey, you tell, tell me a little bit. I mean, you talk, we talked a little bit about this when we did the notes about just the kind of personality he was, almost like a, you know, a cheerleader. and It was listen to everything that was going on. I'll let you swallow. Let me let me choke and then I'll come back. Come back. <clears throat> um, yeah, he was definitely a cheerleader, but he also gave you free reign. You know, um, I, I've done a lot of pictures over the years. I've done um, probably about a hundred films or so. You know, motion pictures and television films. Aside from a lot of television stuff, the best people I ever worked for are the people who give you free reign, who don't try to make you imitate what they want. They just lay out the canvas. They don't micromanage. They don't micromanage. and They, they lay out the canvas of what, what are we trying to achieve, you know. I'll tell you, one, um, let me skip ahead. One of the nicest experiences I had was working with Arnold Schwarzenegger, who directed only one film in his life that I know. It's called um, uh, Christmas in Connecticut um, with Tony Curtis and uh, Chris Christopherson and... Uh, um, when I met with Arnold for the first time, he was a big movie star, you know. And um, I, see, I went to his office in Main Street in um, Venice. And he said, you know, he never worked with, with music before. He doesn't know how to work with music. I said, great. I said, let's talk about the film, what the needs of the film is. Let me worry about the notes. And, um, and then he came to my house and I played all the... And then he had, you know, great in, intuition about what those notes were going to do for the film and how the beats that I played against the beats of the film, and he was, he was great. Um, the, uh, Bob Crew was like that. He, the, the canvas was, here's what we're trying to accomplish. You do it. I'm hiring you to do it, or we're working with you. And then when he'd hear it, he'd, make, he'd bring his own intuition into it, his own thoughts, you know? Yeah, he wasn't so locked into that idea that he, like, like you said, the, the, the one thing that struck me was you bumping your foot on the podium and he immediately perked his ears up and said, what was that? We all knew that. Everyone in the studio, be very careful about what sounds you make because you're going to end up in the record. <laughs> yeah. But that's, that's, to me, that's what, I guess the word is organic because it's not, you know, that's not the sign of somebody who's micromanaging something. It's just, you know. No, he heard something and loved it. It's not micromanaging at all, you know. Okay, we, we have uh, Johnny Harris here who um, <clears throat> I told somebody, I, t I told Taylor earlier, if I just sat here, I could read just your credits. It would take an hour just <laughs> between the two of you. It would take an hour just to read the credits. Uh, I, just, I just told John Harris, um, the first time I saw him, he was conducting for um, Tom Jones at the Palladium in London. And uh, he just said to me, he says, I was dancing around pretty good those days, wasn't I? <laughs> he was, yeah. He was a very, he was great to watch. John Harris was a great, that's you. 
Jamie Harris, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. You're not going to be jumping around like that anymore, huh? No, that's why I walk like this. <laughs> jumping around like that. He was fantastic to watch as a conductor. He really, uh, as great as Tom Jones was, he was half the show. <laughs> Walter, Mike, and him. They wore each other out. They really did. Walter, Mike, and Johnny, uh, uh, Charles, why don't you tell us a little bit about, uh, you obviously had a great success with Love American Style and how that worked into working on Wonder Woman. Uh, um, I came out to do the so I got that movie Goodbye Columbus. Um, I came out to do that picture, and when I finished the film, um, Paramount asked me to stay around to do a pilot for a new show called Love America Style. And it was an anthology series and all that, and um, uh, which meant that there were separate segments that uh, not connected to each other. Uh, stories that had complete be beginning, middle, and end, and, and interspersed between these little kind of comedic vignettes, like little blackouts, as they used to call them. Um, so the man who was the president of Paramount Television at the time was Doug Kramer. And um, remember that? I do, yeah. yeah. Um, and he was a nice man. Anyway, um, I did five years of that show. All the all the episodes of Love American Star were my music over a five-year period. And that led to a lot of other series. Happy Days, by the way, came out of Love American Style. There was an episode of, of it. Uh, that, I didn't know that. Is that right? Love, love and the Happy Days. It was Love yeah. and the Happy Days. Happy Days game. Yeah. And uh, although um, ABC decided not to put it out as a series until American Graffiti came out, you know, the George Lucas film, which was revisiting the 50s, and then they decided to um, try it. And, uh, and that ended up, the first year was pretty successful, but not very much success. And they didn't even use my main, my Happy Day song at the beginning. They used Rock and Round the Clock the first year because they were kind of g going after the success of uh, Rock and Graffiti. Yeah. The second year, they made it a four-camera live show. Um, Gary Marshall, a genius who passed away recently, uh, yeah. used to come out and entertain the audience. and. I tell you, to be in an audience when we did Happy Days those years was just a great experience. It was a beloved show, and people come out screaming, and Gary would make everyone laugh, and, and the characters would come out and take a bow, you know. It was a real family. Anyway, so that one came on the air. Um, then they brought two girls on one day as kind of love interest and became Laverne and Shirley. And uh, that got a very quick response from the audience. We went in the studio, and we made a quick version of our theme. And they put together a quick uh, main title look and shot a few scenes. That was all became a series. Years later, um, Doug Kramer was working um, with, um, well, first of all, Doug Kramer was working with Aaron Spelling. And they called me in, and Doug and Aaron called me in. Um, they have a new show called Love Boat, which is like Love American style on the water. That's how they described it. Oh, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Except it would be a recurring set of characters, you know, the, the uh, captains and all that. Yeah, Jack Jones did it. And Jack Jones sang the song. Yeah, we, right, and yeah. Paul Williams and I wrote that, and we asked Jack Jones to sing it. You know, when it's still was Nor Norman Gibble was involved with these, these songs at that point, your um, lyricist? That was, um, Love Boat was Paul Williams. Oh, okay, no, yeah. Norman wrote those others, though. No, actually, um, the lyricist on uh, Love Marks was Arnold Margolin, one of the creators of the show. And um, but Norman did a lot of my work. You know Norman, don't you? Norman, Norman? Gimbel. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Anyway, Norman did, a, and I had a real collaboration. Well, I I do. I've had sure real, did, yeah. real collaborations with Hal David, with um, Paul Williams, and lots of other people. Um, but the love boat was was Paul was Hal, um, Paul Williams. Jack Jones sang that song, and the show took off right away. Yeah. Um, Doug Kramer then went on at Warner Brothers to start the show called Wonder Woman, which brings That's us here today, part of the reason. Right, yeah. And Doug called me in to do, um, to do the show <clears throat> and uh, talk about a song. So I, I asked Norman Gill to do that with me. And one thing I always remember, Doug uh, called me from l late at night. He'd usually find me at my piano working late at night. And he called me one night, I don't know, 10, 11 o'clock at night, and he said, um, how's it going? I said, great. 
He said, how's the song coming? I said, I've got a song. He said, can I hear it? I said, no, I play songs very often over the phone for people. You know, like this telephone tucked in. <laughs> um, but I said, Doug, are you at a party? He said, yeah. I said, I hear a lot of music. He said, I'm at a party. I said, well, how can you hear my song if there's music? He said, I'll hear it. Don't worry about it. So with his music in the background, I played the song, and he said, I like it. <laughs> so I, I did I did only a few of those Wonder Womans. I didn't do many. We was a two where I'm... I think it was a two you kind of I think you 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 essentially I think set the, set the set the tone for the thing and then it was handed off to people. But that's what I did. And then all you went on the disabled list, playing baseball at my Encino Little League. Oh, that's true. He caught, he got me out one morning to play baseball softball during the Wonder Woman while you were writing Wonder Woman. I was writing Wonder Woman. I, maybe it was the first one, the second one. I don't know. I did a few. Uh, there was a movie before the series two hours, right. and uh, and and really what I did with all my television shows. I established a musical style, and other than Love America Style, I gave those shows away. I didn't stay with them, I didn't ask people to work for me, I just, uh, I did them, I started them, and I, I recommended other people to take over those shows. Um, but in Wonder Woman, I was working on one of the episodes, two hour movies, and my son Robbie here got me to, uh, one Saturday father morning, son, should, should, take, game. should take a break and play baseball. You want to come up here and do that? <laughs> I'll, yeah, tell the I'll tell you the truth. I can't get a word in at home, so here at least I got the microphone. It doesn't help. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, he got me out to play baseball one day, and I went out and I broke my hand. I went in for, I went in for a catch a ball, and I, I fell, and I, I came up like this, and I went to the hospital. I came back with a cast. Perfect timing. Huh? So I called Doug Kramer and I said, Doug, um, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I don't know how I'm going to finish this picture. I said, I'll try to get through it. I'll write with my left hand, which is hard. I'll try to figure it out with my... I said, but the next one I'm, um, I can't do. He said, why don't you get a ghostwriter? I said, well, you're not supposed to know about a ghostwriter. You know? <laughs> We're supposed to have ghostwriters. I think, Charles, that's probably one of the only awards that you haven't been nominated or won is Golden Glove Award, probably, at this point. Golden, Golden Glove. Oh, Golden Glove, right, yeah. <laughs> Golden yeah, yeah. Glove. But anyway, so I will tell you that I recommended Artie Kane. Now, Artie Kane was, you know him. Yeah, yeah. He was the, one of the great studio pianists in this town. Yeah. And uh, I recommended him. And, and at that point, he stopped becoming a pianist and started a whole career as a, as a composer. He did, yeah. he did that show. He did Love Audio. His Odie wife is a copyist, too. His wife, yeah. 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 And, um, and then from that point on, every composer in town hated me because they lost a the great pianist. <laughs> <laughs> and I lost him, too. But, uh, but it started his career, all because of that baseball game. So, yeah, as in most of my shows, all my shows, um, I started them. I did a few episodes. I did a library. And I basically set a style. And... Um, and then passed it on. Did you? I want to ask one quick question. Did you ever work with Ben Lanzaroni when he came out from New York to? Because I know he did a lot of TV work subsequent to. I recommended. Work. I recommended Ben for all those shows too. Yeah, I did. I didn't work with him because we both did the same thing. Right. But I, I, I got Ben on to, to a lot of the shows that I was doing, including right. ha Love Boat. He did a lot of those Love Boats, Happy Days, and all those things. Mm. Johnny, yeah, got involved with uh, when they retooled. They basically, when it changed networks, it uh, essentially was retooled, and they retooled the sound. And you were largely responsible for that, were you not? Yeah, really. It was the third season, and uh, Laura, Linda brought me in. I don't really. I'd already worked with Linda. I put a. Uh, she wanted. I didn't know Linda could sing at the, at the, when I first met her. You know. Uh, well, that's that's right. She because she had become a big star, and because she had been a musical star previous to the show. Yeah, well, she yeah, decided she, to go back out on and, and capitalize yeah. on that. And well, you were yeah, the, yeah. Because she started she when she to. was seventeen. She was uh, she went on the road at the age of seventeen. She was born in Phoenix, Arizona, and she went on the road with this this band. And I didn't know anything about her that far. I just knew her from Wonder Woman, you know. And so uh, her husband at that time was Ron Samuels, who was her manager. And he called me and he said, he'd, he'd see me when I was with Paul Anker. They'd come to see me at uh, Caesar's Palace. They came backstage and I met them. 
um, at this last year I was with Paul, and they, they love my arrangements and all this stuff. And of course, I was jumping up and down like an idiot as I knew. <laughs> um, but in those days, but so uh, cut a long story short, Ron called me and he said, "You know what?" He said, "I I want to do, I want to put Linda into Vegas. I want to put her in Caesar's Palace." And he said, "I want you to do the arrangements. I want you to be a musical director." Uh, so I said, "Okay." And I was I was just done my first movie. Um, in LA, and I had another movie coming up, and I was I put him off. I said, "Well, look, you know, I've got this movie coming up, and I don't know what." He said, "Well, I'll wait." <laughs> okay, I said, "That's all right." So about two weeks later, he Smart called man. me. Smart <laughs> Yeah. Well, well I, I guess so. He um, he called me about two weeks later, and he said, uh, "What what's happening with the movie?" I said, "I'm still waiting," and I had a manager at that time. And he said, I don't know. He said, the, the director's thinking he might want to go with the guy he did the movie, his last movie with. You know what that was, yeah. Charles. You know, they get their favorites. So I said, OK, but I've got another possibility. So I'd like to know sooner or later. Then a friend of mine who was a singer, who I've worked with in England many times, he said, are you serious? <laughs> Do the, screw the movie. This is it. It's Wonder Woman, you know. And it's a whole thing. You don't know where it'll take you, you know. But I thought, OK, that's a smart bit of advice. So I said, okay. <laughs> so I called Ron and I said, I'll do it. And he said, great. He said, turn up tomorrow at the house and meet Linda. I had already met them, as I said, backstage with Paul at the end of my season with him, and, uh, but I didn't know them very well. So I, I turned up at the house. I had to tell you the story. She not me. I, always, I mean, she's beautiful, as you all know. <laughs> and especially in those days when she was young, she was absolutely dropped dead gorgeous. So, sure, yeah, so anyway, I turned up at the house and Ron Sammy's opened the door and he said, oh, Linda will be here in a minute. And she came in in jeans and a t-shirt, no makeup. And I went, oh my God. <laughs> Just so beautiful and such a sweetheart lady. And it was like immediate love affair. I mean, I, I, we are, I, I've been with her for... Well, for 25 years over that time, we've, I went all over the world with her, did not a lot of work, but she is like my sister, you know, and she just appeared recently on my new album that I'm doing as a guest. So uh, anyway, so that was it. So I did the, uh, the Caesar's Palace job, and it was fairly successful. And then the next thing I know, she said, I want you to meet Bruce Lansbury. I want you to do the third season of Wonder Woman, you know. And that's how I got involved in it. And that's when they said, we'd like to, uh, you know, jazz up the, the theme to it. You know, so that's when it I... It basically I went from a period piece to something more contemporary. Yeah, and it was yeah. something... Was, it also was a happening, a feel that that was happening at that time, you know, which we brought up, trying to be current with what was going on in, in music at the time. So that's, that's where it really started. And, uh, and then I did quite a few episodes... Uh, and uh, it was fun. We would be seriously remiss if we didn't talk about how you got from everything before to that point, because that, I found that to be fascinating, what, what you had done as a young man and who, who you'd work with. It kind of blew my mind, to be honest with you. Oh, yeah. Sort of the Welsh Mafia. Oh, yes, yes. By that he means Tom Jones, who's Welsh. Uh, you may not know Dame, that, but Dame he is. Shirley, Dame Shirley Bassey. Dame Shirley Bassey, who's Welsh, and, uh, and my heritage is Welsh, too. In fact, my father went to school with Tom Jones' father. We, I found that out uh, when I started to work with Tom. So, yes, there's the Welsh connection. Very, very strong, too, you know. So that was... Uh, I had a wonderful time with Tom. I toured... That's my first trip to America with Tom Jones. I was still living in England at the time. And uh, we went to Miami, New York, at the Copacabana when it was open. And we then went to Vegas uh, for a month at the Flamingo. And that's 1968. And I always remember flying into, New into Miami. I've never been to America in my life before. I flew into America at night. So I got the hotel, the bed. Woke up the next morning, opened the curtains, and there was a beach right there in the ocean. <laughs> I went, this is incredible, it's sunshine. So I just opened it all, ran out, and, and rented a, a convertible, 
beautiful big white convertible and just drove around Miami for about three hours. I was, and that's when I fell in love with America, and that's why I'm here now, and also I'm a citizen. You, you have a, you have I don't a know stream? If ever, if, if, I don't know who's doing this, but... I don't know. I'm from. trying to keep it away I just from want me. to add something to what he's saying, though, because Tom Jones, you have to know, was like the, 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 one of the biggest stars in the world. I mean, uh, and women was, it was like post Beatle, but they were screaming him when he was singing, you know. Um, but really, Johnny, we, as I said, we, we, we saw you a number of times, but the London Palladium the first time, and uh, it was great to watch Tom Jones. It was great to watch this gentleman conduct, too, because he had all the movement and, and uh, the music. You know, was, you'd, you'd watch both people, but uh, this was a very exciting time in music. Uh, yeah. He had some enormous hits. What's New Pussycat? No yeah, I mean, when, when we went to, uh, to Vegas, especially, uh, in 68, um, Tom was the hottest thing on the planet. I mean, everybody came to see him. And fortunately, because of our relationship and our heritage, and that, we were very close, Tom and I. I was always in his, I changed in his dressing room. I went in his Rolls Royce. You know, I was like right with him all the time. So I met everybody that came at uh, Elvis Presley. I mean, you name it, Elvis Presley. All of them came backstage to meet him, you know? So I met everybody. And, uh, but when we got at, at Vegas, he was so hot. That Gordon Melsey's manager, you remember Gordon, right? Uh, he had these can little canisters of candy made up, and they were like fever pills, Tom Jones fever pills. And they gave them out as all the women were coming in. So if you get excited, you better plop one of these real quick, you know. Which is a fabulous idea. That was Gordon. He was very brilliant that way. And, so, and of course, that's that one. It was an amazing time. Is it true about the underwear? Oh, yes. Yeah, with the keys in them. <laughs> you, always knew, you always knew when one hit the ground, you know, that, oh, that's got the, the key to the door, you know, the hotel room, and it clang. Under, yes, underwear was flying at us. Well, at him. <laughs> Luckily, it didn't hit me in the head. But, but it, was, oh, it was an amazing time. It was. It, it was, and I met everybody. And I've got a little story to tell you if you've got a minute. Uh, Don Rickles. So Don Rickles. And I'd never... I'd just come to America. I was, I was still walking around going, I want to live here. I want, and eventually I did. I moved out about and a couple of years later. Paul Anker and came to America. For the rest of history. Anyway, so... We, Paul, uh, Tom said, we got to go and see this guy, Don Rickles. He's in a lounge somewhere. So I said, who's Don Rickles? He said, he's a comedian. I said, oh, okay. So I said, all right. And this is a little war with your, what you were talking about, about me earlier on. And so we went in, and I said, I didn't know he was. And then I realized this guy insults everybody, and that was his stick. And he got to Tom, and I was sitting next to Tom, and, and he said, and we got Tom Jones, and, you know, you think his guy moves? You want to see his conductor? It looks like Tom's standing still. What do you do? And I would like. You had I wanted a to ring. Where's you a big hole? And Tom looked at me. He kind of looked. He went. I said, "I like this. I don't want to." But it was true. <laughs> Anyway, so, yeah, that and, of course, Shirley. You've got a strange footnote in Beatles history, too. I've got a you? strange foot, yeah. Oh, well, I <laughs> But don't you have a... a you're, you're connected to a little strange footnote in Beatles history. Oh, yeah, well, uh, I met the boys. Um, I'm thinking about, about Jimmy Nickel. That's right. To, okay. to, Jimmy Nickel was uh, is a drummer, a very good drummer, and I was... Uh, in he was your drummer. Yeah, he was. He was. Uh, I was doing um, at Pie Records in London. I was doing. Uh, an Australian guy came up and he had this idea for making. Uh, he called it Top Six. And he was going to put an EP out with three songs on either side. So six, Top Six, and we had to like. You had to try and guess what the hits would be the, the next month, and at that time it was quite easy because they were all most of the hits were the you know the Beatles, so I would do. My version, I would transcribe them and get singers in, and we would do it. And we put the first disc out, and it came in at, uh, in, in our charts at about number 30, which we thought, oh, we've got a winner here. 
then people start, the kids who have bought it suddenly realize, wait a minute, this is not the original, these are copies, you know? So it soon went down the path. But Jimmy Nickel was, the reason I'm telling you this, is Jimmy Nickel was the drummer for me, and he knew all of the, of the Beatles songs, you know, because he'd already recorded them with me. And when, uh, when uh, Ringo Starr got sick, he got tonsillitis, and the boys were, the group was going to go to Australia, Scandinavia for then Australia, and they needed a drummer. So he went and auditioned, and he got the job. And so that one, of, one of many fifth Beatles. Do you, do you remember well, the I mean, right, but in, in, uh, in England at that time, I mean, all the nightly news would come on like nothing politics. It was the fifth Beatle, Jimmy Nickel, is so and so and You know, and Third World War is going to blow up any minute. But no, 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 Jimmy Nichols, he was the, he was the lead story in all the major news. Do you remember the original, the original drummer of the Beatles before, mm. before Ringo? Oh, yeah, it was, uh, what was his name? What was his name? Pete Best. Uh, Pete, Pete Best. Best. Thank you. I, I did an album with Pete Best. Did you? Right after the Beatles dumped him. <laughs> <laughs> you got him on the refund. <laughs> um, I did an, I arranged an album from Atlantic Records. He was not a happy guy. <laughs> yeah. uh, but he was a very good drummer. He's better dr- drummer than Ringo, actually. I, I think, think. Yeah. 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 Well, that's, that's what I'd heard. You know? um, yeah, that was... But, you know, Ringo had his own thing. You know, he got it. He eventually got it straight. No, it's a lot go, of guys. You, you that, can't go back on history, though. No, that's true. But the thing is that, right? But the thing is, a lot didn't a lot of guys uh, play on the on the records, and he didn't play. I, mean, I think so. There are there are people there are people that will tell you that Pete Best was the heartthrob, the fan favorite, and that could have been part of the reason too. And and Ringo got along. Ringo was one of the lads more more than Pete was. Yes. If you read a book called The History of Northern Songs. Uh, uh, all about the publishing music, uh, yes. And actually, Ringo, uh, Paul McCartney's father used to complain to Brian Epstein that Pete Best was getting all the accolades and the women, and, and that would, it really helped to, to dump him. They thought that it was he was getting too much of the attention. Yeah. It was a nice I didn't know that. Him. That's interesting. I didn't know that. History of Northern Songs, very very good book. Yeah. And your your daughter wrote a book about you, <laughs> right? And Elvis is in the title. Yes. Explain that one. <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, the title of the book is The Man Who Turned Down Elvis Twice. Uh, and this wasn't like, hey, aren't I clever? Uh, I got to meet, as I said earlier on, I got to meet everybody when I was with Tom in Flamingo in, in 1968, in Puerto And that's when the first time I met Elvis. Uh, and then on subsequent, once I moved here, I got to meet him a couple of occasions. Uh, and eventually, I was with I was working with Paul Anker, and I was living. I'd moved to America. I was living in Vegas, and um, he was at at the uh, I was it the Continental or no? What's with the big hotel in Vegas? It's the only one. He's the only one that filled it. It Caesar, was cool. Caesar's Palace. No, no, it wasn't International? International. 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 Thank you. The International. Uh, um, it's the only one that could fill it, uh, and. Uh, he was playing there one night, so I, my wife and I, my ex-wife and I, went up and uh, we went to see the show. And uh, the MDs and the uh, maitre d's knew who I was because I was working with Paul a lot in Vegas. And anyway, he said, "You want to come back to say hi to Elvis afterwards?" You know, backstage. So I said, "Yeah, I'd love to." So I came back, and he remembered me, and he said, "Great." And we just chatted a quick, a little bit, and then he said, "You know what?" want to conduct for me, you got a job, John. I said, well, that's great. That was lovely. And I was very, very uh, flattered. And uh, I said, well, I'm under contract with Paul Anker, so I can't do that. He said, well, if, just remember, if you ever want, you know, the way you move and the way I move, blah de blah de you know. So, well, that was nice, so, but I turned him down because I was under contract. I couldn't do it. And about a year before he passed, I was still in Vegas, and I went to see him again. And uh, he invited, I was invited backstage, and again he came up to me and he said, well, is that offer still there, John? And I said, you know, I'm still with Paul, and I really can't do that. I'm so sorry. And uh, but he said, it's all right, man, but just, just remember, that's it. You know? And then he showed me his Pulsar watch. Do you remember when they first came out, the Pulsar watches? It was like a little red 
digital thing here. I'd never, I'd never seen one. Because Elvis got the very first one that's ever made, I suppose. And he was showing it to me like it was a toy, you know? And he was like, not like a little boy, he's like very childlike. He was so, wow, isn't this cool, John? Isn't this great? Look at this watch, man. I'm going, that's great. He was a very, very sweet gentleman. He really was. So, to cut a long story short, um, I said no, and a year later he passed, unfortunately. So explain to me how you got, get from Paul Anka and turning down Elvis to doing disco music for Wonder Woman. That to me is, and, and then there's a, isn't there a little side step, step into Buck Rogers in there somewhere? Too? Oh, uh, thank you. God, I can do anything without this guy. He's leading me all the time. It's great. <laughs> Memories. Oh. Yeah. Uh, that again was Bruce Lansbury was producing that uh, the first season. And, uh, he approached me and he said, uh, would you like to, no, I'm going to do this series, Buck Rogers. And he said, uh, I want you to do the scores. So um, that's how that occurred. Yeah. So it was, uh, I, also, I did, uh, I think it was Powers of Matthew Starr prior to that, after Wonder Woman. That's another Bruce Lansbury series. So I'd done two series with him and then he offered me the... Uh, I've read where the one of the themes in, in Buck Rogers was actually retooled and became a huge disco hit in Miami in 1980. Oh, you're talking about Odyssey. There you go. Okay, thank goodness you remembered, because I had forgotten. Um, yeah, that it was funny, because uh, if, did you guys ever see Buck Rogers? I mean, uh, yeah? You've got a lot of fans here, this is really cool. So you don't have to explain anything. It's so lovely to talk to you all. I mean that sincerely, because you're all fans of this genre, and that makes me happy. Um, so at least I know you are the, I'm saying you understand. So uh, I think it was the third episode, and I can't remember, but it was called Space Rockers was the actual, I think, the, the title of that episode. And in it was a... Space Rock, it was a rock band, and they were all dressed up with lights and stuff. It was really, very really well done. And they were playing instruments that, uh, you know, they weren't instruments, but they were sliding their hands all over it, you know, this and this, all the, the stuff. The there, was no bar. there was no sound, you know, so we were just, they were just doing their thing. And Bruce said, well, you know, we need to do something. I said, well, yeah, otherwise it's going to look really silly if you no sound, for Christ's sake. So, yeah. so I said, uh, okay. So I went home and uh, I, had, I worked on the episode, the score. But when I got to that, um, I thought, wow, we've got to do something with synthesizers. And I, had, I can't remember his name, Charles. I hope he's still alive. But he was one of the top synthesizer players uh, um, in this town. And he was brilliant. He could play anything, read anything. It was unbelievable. And it was the early days of synthesizers with all the, you know, the... Plugging in this, and it's not like it is now with the computers. So uh, I said, "Okay, I got this this rock." You know, what if this might have been was it Larry Fast back in by any chance? Because I remember he, he was. I can't, I can't remember. Mike Bonner. No, Bonner yeah. was like yeah. Mike Bonner. Yeah, that Bonnaker would make sense right too. Now. What was his name? Mike Michael Bonner. Anybody else? <laughs> I know. You know, one, I, of the, I, one of the first guys was the guys from the Mother of His Invention. Remember that his name Ian something? No, I can't. Uh, no, I can't. But it, but the the point is that when I got to this piece, um, it was we did it at the end of the recording session because I only used the rhythm section and this guy on the synthesizer. And they, they, they had like seventy four piece orchestra, and they all most of them just went home and you know it was over for them. And we just did this at the end, and uh, it we just. I wrote most of it, but I let this guy go crazy, and he had to watch the screen. Because this guy on the screen, they were doing all this, running their hands over this stuff, and like these instruments, and he was going, Woo! and he was watching the screen, and I said, you do it, you know, I can't write that, just watch it. Blah, 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 blah. And, and so they did. So, I mean, the rhythm section said, oh, they were doing their thing, and giving them that nice beat. And he just went crazy over the top of it, you know. Just we turned his stuff around so he could see the screen, yeah. you know. So he, was, he had his back to me, and he just watched it. And he was doing all this stuff, and it was just amazing. We, everybody loved it. It was fine. The episode aired, and then I got a call from music department at Warner's uh, at Universal, and the guy said, uh, "Casey and the Sunshine Band." What was his name? The guy was. Uh, 
the, the lead singer of that band. KC. It was KC, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so he said, I got a call from his, his office saying that he watched, saw the episode and he wants to record it and put it out as a disco <laughs> thing. I, went, I said, are you, are you kidding me? He said, no. So he said, he, can I have him call you? I said, yeah, sure. You know. So I got a call and uh, his partner called me and uh, he said, yeah, we want to do this. So we want to get you permission to use the tracks. So I said, well, if it's okay with Universal, you know, he said, yeah, they're okay. Are you okay? He said, yeah. He said, we're going to add, add some hand claps and a few in my, put an, I think put an extra guitar on it or something. And the next thing, bingo. You know, it was a, a disco hit. And it also was used in uh, Grand Theft Auto, the yeah. first video game. <laughs> and they put it on the ra- You know, somebody's going to shoot somebody's head off and they put the radio on it. And, and there I am, you know. That's great. And uh, yeah, good. so that was exciting. Good, good, <laughs> good was planning. What? Well, good planning. <laughs> well, yeah, that was that was fun. That was funny. God. So that basically led. I mean, that that sort of set set your work on Wonder Woman up, though, too, didn't it? In a yeah. way. Yeah. Well, what you did, what you came in and contributed in, at the end of the show. Well, the shows run the the, the the sort of disco music. Well, for, for for Wonder Woman. Yeah. Yeah, that, but that was after Buck Rogers. I mean, it was, That's what before, I mean. it was before Buck Rogers. Yeah. Wonder Woman was before Buck Rogers. Well, then I reverse my statement. <laughs> Where are you working next week? <laughs> <laughs> it's a, you know, I, I was enjoying the wonderful world of women myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's always a wonderful show. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I guess that uh, from there on out, the rest is history, I guess. Unless you have any else to say. <laughs> well, I would just encourage you to look into the music of both these gentlemen because we have just skimmed the surface. And you in particular, uh, we were talking about earlier, in 2013, the uh, Radio 6 of the BBC did a two-hour special on you. That's right, yeah, yeah. That, that, that was cool. That was really cool. <laughs> I didn't know about it until somebody told me. He said, oh, you're on the radio. I said, oh, that's good. So my daughter told me, because she still lives in England. And Charles, we've not even, we've not even talked about your incredible co- contributions in, in songwriting. Oh, it's, it's unbelievable. Song of the Year is not too bad. Yeah. Um, there you go. Well, I wanted to ask you about that, that song. Where is the melodic sense come from? Because it's very unusual. The structure does it come from the lyrics? Killing me softly. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, in my collaboration with Norman Gimbel, he wrote the music, the lyrics first. So the music was always an outgrowth of what I perceived the song was about. In this case, we started off with an idea of um, Norman had a book of of titles and lyrics ideas, and one day he skimming through and he said, "What about a song called Killing Me Softly with His Blues?" And, and blue sounded like an old-fashioned word even then. Mm-hmm. So then he said, what about, he just changed it. He said, what about killing me softly with the song? So that sounded unique, and we talked about the effect. We all get moved by songs, and songs have messages for each of us. And he said, we said, that's a good idea. So he went home and he wrote it. And he called me a couple of hours later, and I, I took the lyric down mm-hmm. over the phone. And it just came right out, right out of my, you know, my work in that day. And the next day, we were, by the next day, we had a song. Yeah. yeah. I've always thought there's, there's, when I read that you had done work in, in, with the Latin bands, I kind of, you can almost hear that song in Spanish working beautifully. You know, I, uh, someone just sent me a record uh, the other day of three, uh, three or four uh, tenors in um, Latin America. I don't know, but Puerto Rican or what. They made a big version of that with four ten. I mean, it's been recorded in every language, and yeah. um, with different titles. Um, in French, I think it's called uh, "Chante ma vie en musique," which means she sings my songs in music. Um, just something about cantando, singing something in Spanish. I don't know, but um, it's always right to have other people, you know, absolutely yeah. hear your songs and do your songs and. and we still, we still have new recordings all the time. Well, I, I got to say that, sorry, i just quickly say that that's one of my favorite songs. Uh, and I think it's a classic. Uh, 
And it, it's wonderful, man. Thank you. Thank you. Job, man. Really good. Thank you. Anybody? Have questions? I'll just tell you, by the way, so um, I'll just... Uh, <laughs> We were in England. Um, really? We, we were invited last November, last May. Uh, we received an invite from, from Prince Charles. <laughs> you did? Yes, and the Duchess of Cornwall. Of course, yeah. yeah. Um, and we have actually framed the invitation because that's pretty cool. Oh, of course. And yeah. uh, they had a, an evening uh, a reception for all the previous British Oscar winners. Really? So we went, my wife, Joan, and I, yeah. we went there. And when I was in, we spent some time with Prince Charles, and he was really cool. He was really nice. We spent some time. Yeah. so, yeah. And um, that uh, and uh, and then we spent some time with with her as well. Well, there was a lot of people, but they sh we spent five or six minutes with each of them. And when I met her, she said, um, "Would I know any of your music?" The, the, this is a uh, Duchess. Uh, this is Camilla. Right. So I said, "Well, you, you know, you might know Killing Me Soft." She says, "Oh, that's one of my favorites." She said, and now that I know you, I'm going to have to get a copy. So I said, I'd love to send you a copy. Well, the next day in my, it came into spams. I didn't find it for a month. I got it out from the palace. Oh. This is how you contact the uh, yeah, right. Duchess. So I sent her a copy of that, and I autographed it to, the, to your royal highnesses. Did you ever do that? Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> To your royal highnesses with an autograph. And then I also sent them a copy of my Seasons record, which I think you have today, which is my new record. Anyway, I got the loveliest personal letter back from her. Yeah, Dear Charles, and an all handwritten and whatever. My, you, we, it's our favorite song, and thank you. And, and for Merry Christmas from both of us, which you haven't like. Yeah, Camilla. Oh, that's I'm great. now on the first name basis with. Uh, there you go. Camilla. Congratulations <laughs> on that one. Great, man. <laughs> yes, you had a question? You know, I love Roberta Flax because she had the original. Uh, it's the one I've heard around the world, and it's. Um, I mean, I love the Fujis too. The Fujis are great. We, we've had. I, I lost count years ago with a thousand and over a thousand recordings, so it could be two thousand recordings. I, I don't even know anymore, but I know everyone sings it, um, and I always loved. You know, you, you never get tired of hearing someone else sing your song. You know, although I'll, I'll tell you an experience that I had recently. We were on a, on a boat on this cruise, and uh, they had a, we were invited on this on the love boat cruise, and uh, they were doing the voice. You know, you ever see the voice on television? They do their version of the voice, um, which just two weeks ago um, featured Killing Me Softly, and they did a whole episode of my song. So I didn't, other than that, I hadn't seen the voice. So I didn't know how it works, but there's these three chairs, and, they, and you know, you've seen the show, the big red chairs, and yeah. you're not looking, the singers, you, when you see someone you like, you hit the bell, they turn you around, and anyway, as a surprise to me, the very last singer sang Killing Me Softly, but she was so bad. <laughs> she was so bad, I'm thinking, I, I know I have to press this bell, because it's be embarrassing if I don't. Oh, no. And I finally hit the bell, and, the, and so then I have to tell her what I like. I said, well, I like your choice of songs. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way to get out of it. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, you know, 9 to 5 was a, was, a, was a great project. I will tell you this. Um, the Musicians went, Union went on strike. Oh, I can't think of the name of the orchestrator. British, British orchestrator. Um, Ken Thorne. Who? Ken Thorne. You know Ken oh, Thorne. Ken. Okay. Oh, Ken. Oh, yeah. So, he um, passed us about three years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And brilliant, actually, the last brilliant. time I saw Ken was here. We were on a panel together in, oh, this, really? in this place. Um, it, w it was really an, a nice project to work on because there's a lot of opportunity. You know, there was the, the, those three scenes in particular, the three fantasy scenes. Um, I was supposed to record it here in California, obviously. And then we went on strike here, and then Lionel Newman, who's head of music for 20th Century Fox, said, why don't you go to London and spend a couple months, we'll get you a nice flat, work it there and record there. And um, then England went to run with, with a strike over here, so then they wanted me to record in Germany, and I, I spoke to some of the people. I spoke to Marvin Hamlish, who said he refused to go, so I didn't either. Um, so actually, Ken, 
did my orchestra. He worked with me here, the orchestration. Mm -hmm. uh, of all my films, sometimes I use orchestrated, sometimes I didn't. It just depended on my schedule. Yeah. But Ken was great. It was the like he went over to Germany and he rec he conducted um, all the music. I I actually for the soundtrack because I didn't get quite the syncopations and stuff. You know, you mentioned Latin music. A lot of my music has those kind of Latin syncopations. I guess you would call it because even in Wonder Woman. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, it's kind of in my think, in my body, those kind of. It's your language, musical mm -hmm. language. It's part it's of my, It's in my musical language, yeah. Um, anyway, I didn't get quite the precision I wanted with the German orchestra in Munich. So I went here in the studio and I recorded half of the album over the Fox Let Me, uh, 20th Century Fox Let Me Go Back and re record it. I worked with Colin Higgins, who, um, who was a great director. I had just finished a, uh, doing Foul Play with Colin Higgins, and that was a great experience. But Colin was a friend, and um, um, you know, it, it was um, it was a lot of challenges. It was a lot of fun. It was a fun movie. It did did really well, by the way, and um, uh, it was a good experience. Yeah. You know what? I'm I'm working on a show right now with Sid and Marty Croft. Um, in the early seven, actually before I moved there, probably 1969, 1970, um, there was a show on the air called uh, Bugaloo, uh, Puff and Stuff, excuse me, Puff and Stuff. It was a big successful show. But Marty called me and asked me if I would do the score and write all the songs. And that was actually my introduction to working with Norman Gimbel. I didn't have a lyricist that I worked with. I'd work with Bob Crew. Uh, and I was in the office of the head of BMI one day, and I said, uh, I need a recommendation for a lyricist. I was in New York at the time. And he said, I think you guys will get along, you and Norman Gimbel. And Norman had written things like Girl from Ipanema, and it's all the great bossa novas. And so he called Norman, and we put us together, and, and we started working together. So we wrote, we wrote uh, I guess, about eight songs. We are really, Marty right now is trying to get that as a Broadway, as a, not a Broadway show, but a stage show. We're talking right now about after 40 years about moving that onto the stage. It still holds up, the, the characters hold up, the songs we think hold up. But Marty and Sid are back. They have about three or four series on the air right now, including a show that I did for them in the early 70s called The Bugaloos. Anyone remember that? We are, I, I just redid a new version of The Bugaloos a few weeks ago. And um, I'm, again, I'm just helping him set a musical style for the show. I'm not going to do it, but I'm setting him kind of a musical style. And, um, but it's fun. It's a different set of characters, you know, different people. The others have grown up. Uh, but it's fun to look at again. And those guys are just inventive. You know, they don't never stop. Yeah. Question? Hey, uh, do you have any stories about the green slime? <laughs> 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 That's the, sh that's the show is going to haunt me forever. <laughs> um, I forget the guy's name, but he, I got a call. Actually, BMI recommended me to the producer of that. BMI did. And I went to see him, and he, and, um, he asked me to do the music for this movie called The Green Slime. It was, it was a Japanese sci-fi picture. Um, Billy Crystal does a great imitation of those Japanese where the letters go like this, and, and the words come out in English that don't match the, the, uh, the, the voice at all. Um, anyway, it was not a composing job. It was a job of finding music from a music library. And um, it was a, I needed a job, and I took the job. And I went home, and I started to feel real badly that I took this job, that I'm, now I'm going to have to spend weeks in a music library finding other people's music. So I called his, uh, I think it's Joe Bellucci was his name, you would know. I called him up and I said, Joe, I can't do the show. He said, why not? I said, I can't stand the idea of being in a music library just trying to find music. I, he said, you know, you'll do it fast, you promised me. I was, anyway, he talked me back into doing it. So I went to a music house. And um, it was my only experience with this. And I decided where music would go. And I hadn't done my first picture yet. I had no pictures. But I knew this was a terrible first one to have my name on. <laughs> <laughs> I <did. laughs> but I promised him he was going to pay me. And I needed the money, you know. So I went to the music house. And, and you, 
an experience I'll never forget. He needs suspense music, a sci-fi, and listen, listen. All right, I'll have some. How much you want? About a quarter of a pound of that. Boom. And, then, <laughs> and working like fast uh, chase music. I'm giving you three quarters of a pound. Boom. You know. And then we put it into the picture. And I put demos records I had. I put so I don't know. I put stuff. It was horrible. Horrible. I'm sorry you asked. Um, and somehow, and I said, okay, I'll do the picture. If you, as long as you don't put my name on the picture, that was my only condition. Don't put my name, and he agreed. And then the picture came out, and it said, "Music by Charles Fox." <laughs> It was a Japanese composer who did it first, and I used the bits and pieces of it. I just, it was a total hodgepodge. I put his, and they put his name, so it came out with my name. And for many years, I'd walk into a recording studio or a dubbing theater, and people would say, I saw your movie last night, pretty good. <laughs> and they would say, uh, and they would say, why'd you do that movie? And I'd say, I didn't, but I, I, I did it for the money. I said, but why did you watch it? You know, it <laughs> Better question. There were stories of green slime was the stuff that this goo that comes from outer space and it goes under doors and devours people. You know? <laughs> the good thing is that it didn't devour my career. That was the best thing. <laughs> so. Nothing like the blob, though. <laughs> yes. Johnny, can you talk a little bit about rearranging a classic, iconic <laughs> Yeah, well, that's what I wanted to retain was the melody. And uh, the, the lyric, I decided just to use Wonder Woman, and I used three guys instead of the girls, and, uh, and we, we doubled them, and they ju that's all they sang. And the rest of it was, uh, what I basically went was trying to get a new, like a feel that was more current to what was happening at that particular time. And I had two, some, two great musicians, uh, Paul Lyme on drums and Ken Wilde on bass, and I had started their career uh, about six months, uh, seven or eight months before we did that, uh, that, that theme, and we started the series, uh, series three. And I was doing a Tom Jones album, I'll just uh, digress a little bit to explain. Um, uh, and my contractor at the time, uh, when I turned up at the studio to do this Tom Jones album, he said, I can't, I got bad news, I don't have, I can't get the drummer you wanted in the bass player. You always, you know, I said, well, what, what the heck did I get? So he said, there's two new guys. It's a guy called Paul Lyme on drums and Ken Wilde on bass. I said, okay, so I met them and they were young guys and they were new in town. And I thought, oh, well, you know, that's, you know, He'll know exactly where you feel. So, okay, so I said, all right. And we were doing rhythm section first. I was going to sweeten it later. So I said, okay, let's the first, you know, put the music up in the stands. Da, da, da. Immediately, you know, you know this when you hear that drummer and that. It's immediate. You fall in love immediately with these two guys of reading straight away and fabulous. So I decided from then on to use them on anything else I did. And then we got to this that series, and that was the first time they'd ever done a TV. You know, oh, been right in like we did at the Warner's lot, and it, they'd never done that before. Done. So I said, okay, I want to get this feel going. And uh, Kenny Wallen basically, well, I've got an idea. Come on, boom, on the bass. I didn't write that. I just written this. So we got that feel going, and I thought, well, I need the melody. And I'd already written that for the orchestra. And I used French horns. Boo, doo, 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 doo. Yeah. There, right? And I had strings going. Da, 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 against that. Then it was, I felt it was pretty exciting. Then, one woman, they just come in on that bit. So that's basically where the feel came from that the guys that I, the drummer and the bass player and the guitar player, gave me the exactly the foundation I needed to, to, to
to support his melody, you know, and to quote that, right. It honors Charles' music, and it's a great original. Well, thank you. Yeah, well, it, it was great material to work with, you know, so um, that was that was a fun thing. And actually, it was so funny because uh, whilst I was recording it, I looked at my music and I said, look upstairs. And I looked up at the control room. There's like 20 people in there. I said, what the heck is it? And it, it got around, you know. Yeah. Better come and hear this, yeah. you know. It was great. It was and great. So, uh, so, yeah, it was successful and uh, it was fun. It was That's a good question. Thank you for asking it. Anybody else? Well, I think unless you gentlemen have anything to, to add, I think we're going to wrap it up for the day. I think we're fine. Yeah. I, I'll, just, I'll just say one last thing, I'll end. It's a little premature, but Veray Saraben, who is releasing this, this record, uh, is putting together um, an album now. It will be out, I don't know, before the end of the year, of all my television themes. Oh, cool. So, um, awesome. Yeah, I actually have about 50. But we're only going to put about 35 on this record. Oh. Yeah. What label? Berez, Sarah Berez. They're working on that now. So I'm excited about that. You know, all yeah, these that'd shows be good. and pilots and long-running shows and record versions and things like that. And uh, We have a record version that I did um, of, the, of Wonder Woman. I call the group the New World Symphony. Really? Um, anyway, yeah. that'll be on there too. But cool. Um, anyway, I'll just tell you because you guys are all fans of those things. So yeah. look, look for that, okay? That's good. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you, Thank you.